Yep, I'll be speaking today about traditional versus non-traditional color terms applied to Sapphire. Um, the trend, and we're looking at basically trend versus passion. So uh, trend is gonna be the peach color and teal, and the passionate colors are gonna be Pantaraja and blue. Uh, they, they're, those two colors specifically are, have a long history. Uh, so B will de uh, denote blue, BV, uh, bluish violet. And then uh, on, the, uh, it, on the inverse, GB, greenish blue, and then bluish green. Um, and then the same would be in, uh, applied to orangish red and reddish orange, which will be paparaja mm -hmm. versus peach. I would, I would uh, really recommend or advise that you ask questions because it can, I, I, I'm 99% sure I would have the answers for you, but um, the, the goal is to basically answer your questions so you can walk away with as mu uh, much knowledge as you can from this session. <clears throat> so uh, a couple of things I'd like to discuss, what's driving the teal color uh, sapphire market. When did this trend begin? How long will it last? Pricing volatility, understanding the color, uh, the GIA color wheel. Um, is there a pricing difference between heated and unheated? And how does origin impact color? So to get started, let's have a look at the GIA uh, color wheel. <clears throat> so when, we're, when I'm referencing uh, teal, green, bluish green or bluish blue, it's gonna be in the spectrum from right here, greenish blue, all the way to strongly yellowish green. It's pretty broad. And uh, then one other uh, type of stone that would fall into this category is also bicolor, where it's gonna be bicolor between yellow and green. So this would be an example of true teal. It's near 50-50 blue and green. This color is definitely consumer driven and most of the consumer driven products are actually starting in jewelry is started by the designer. The designer um, will design a piece which is um, which is, um, I would say, attractive to a consumer. And through that process, consumer-driven, designer-driven, it goes back to the source and the source countries will start not really searching it. it uh, it's not really searching for it, but they will begin collecting more. Uh, typically, most corundums in source country, most corundum is gonna be collected and so in a lot of cases held, but that also will push the, uh, the pricing side of, of uh, that specific color where, for example, for the, for the time being, I'll bring up a, um, this, this stone in particular is uh, one that I did own. It's 4.01 carat and it's a round, perfect teal. And in 2015, you're looking at maybe 125 per carat. Right now it's gonna go for over a thousand. So that's the, uh, how drastically the prices have changed. Non-traditional bridal, it's a different uh, market sector. Millenn the millennial generation is more budget conscious in regards to luxury goods uh, uh, and interest. Uh, they're constantly looking at value, which is quality times price, uh, sustainability, ethics, transparency, and a transparent supply chain. I think when we get into the, sub uh, into the subject matter of uh, sustainability, ethics, and transparency, I, uh, my best advice to you all is to be uh, very cautious because it's being used as a buzzword primarily. Uh, I think um, what I've been hearing, we'll, we'll, I'll be doing another lecture in Dallas coming up but, um, with the government panel, but they're using the, the designers, or the retailers tend to be using this in a, uh, basically in a manner to drive more sales, not necessarily vetting the suppliers or the process to make sure that it truly is sustainable, ethical, and transparent. Um, so this is what I would categorize as a bicolor. Uh, as you can see in the center, we see a yellowish green hue. 
and on either end, uh, teal to green. We're finding the for most of the bicolors that I've been finding in Sri Lanka uh, through our through the mines that I work with, uh, generally in smaller sizes, half a carat to 1.5 carats. But in Madagascar, I would say we're finding larger sizes, uh, upwards of five, six, and seven carats. But um, Sri Lanka in particular, I'm, I'm seeing bicolors are smaller. Primary origin for this color is going to be uh, Madagascar, Sri Lanka, Montana, and Australia. Um, as most of you might know, uh, Australian sapphires are uh, mined at a metamorphic level. That's typically going to be uh, relatively deep. I would say under a, or, or more than 150 feet in depth, maybe closer to 200. Whereas uh, Sri Lanka and Montana, um, generally, most of the mining is happening from surface level down to about 100 and 120 feet maximum. Uh, Madagascar, I, uh, it, it's, uh, Madagascar is a work in progress, I would say. Their uh, mining practice is not very environmentally friendly, but um, there is plenty of material available, starting at as shallow as five feet. Uh, and again, a lot of the green, teal, and bicolor, uh, yellowish green bicolor, uh, the finest material that I've seen in the last five years is coming from Madagascar. Color description by origin. Um, one thing that we do that I would say we're finding the finer color of green and teal uh, from Madagascar. That means a uh, greater saturation, uh, depth of color, and a nice medium hue. The Sri Lankan material tends to have this uh, yellowish uh, low yellowish hue to it, or sometimes it would have a more earthy tone. Uh, and those could be two discrepancies to even identify origin. Uh, the other origin factor with uh, sapphire that I've found uh, for quick ID is uh, small crystal inclusions. Typically in the Madagascar material, uh, it's going to be thousands and thousands of tiny uh, crystals. And um, you know when you see that under 10x, it's a quick identifying factor. So uh, I just want to give you guys a quick pricing example uh, of how prices changed. Uh, I'm I'm going to this graph displays from 2014 to 19, but if you guys are keeping notes, I can give you uh, the 20 and 21 update. Um, so as you can see here. Going back to 2014, we're looking at roughly 185 per carat, and we're looking at an average size of 1.5 carats, $185 per carat. And then by 15, we're hitting 200, 16, 280, 17, 300, uh, 18, 365, 19, you're looking at 390. So right now, um, I was speaking to Melanie before we started, and I've seen an 80% increase in price in this color range uh, this year, just from January 1st to the end of July. Um, so that's one uh, speaks for the popularity of the color. Again, we're going back to designer driven and consumer driven. Uh, but also, it's the risk that it might go against the traditional blue is because of the fluctuation, or not the fluctuation, but the drastic increase in price of blue, the blue sapphires. So if we take that four carat uh, round that we saw in the third slide, uh, something like that, which for a teal, four carat fine is 1,000 to, let's say, 1150 for something similar in blue fine color, you're looking at about 3,500 to 4,000. So drastic, drastic, drastic change in price more than three times. So that is one of the primary reasons why designers are move, shifting the, uh, to different colors, fancy colors, and it's attracting the consumer market. Uh, sometimes in uh, using the word greenwashing helps make it more attractive. And in the end, the product is moved, but you have to decide um, if that works, you know, between the buzzwords, 
the pricing shifts and uh, how it's sourced, whether that's going to work uh, you and your company. So predictions off colors are typically very cyclical, uh, meaning up and down. They will come in and out of style. So if you look at any fashion, technically we're in the fashion industry. So if you look at any fashion, uh, you know, let's take for example suits. What was in fashion in the let's say the the early 1900s? Then you move on like 30 years, it came into fashion again. Another 30, 40 years back again. Expect the same with uh, with color and style. Uh, green is very strong color. I predict based on demand and supply that this will continue for at least two to three years uh, and possibly even more. I, uh, right now, with where things stand globally, uh, when we're looking at um, supply chain, uh, right now supply chain is right now mining is at under five uh, under ten percent globally, and in Sri Lanka, which I would say is a uh, is a major uh, mining locality. It's it's right around seven percent. Um, so that that's also shifting the price upwards because there's less availability. Um, so like I said, let's say three to four years for the time being, in one to two carat round oval emerald cut and cushion. Fancy shapes tend to be niche. For example, right now, uh, a very popular color is is pear. Or sorry, popular shape is pear. And um, so th again, that fits into your business model. If you're a dealer or a retailer, how many pear shapes uh, do you want to, to sit on? Um, I would say with fancy shapes such as pears or marquees, uh, that could change within a matter of months. Um, so again, uh, very dependent on your business model and how quickly you were able to adapt to change. So before we move on, that's the end of my first section. Please go ahead. Are there any questions? Okay, I have a question, um, Shihan. So primarily, jacking up the price is basically the supply chain is not moving. Number one, no mining. Number two, and shifting of the designers to the fancy color primarily because of the cost of the blue is crazy. Uh, and that is what driving the popularity of the fancy color. Yeah, you know, it, it's, we're gonna see color shifts really quickly. Yeah. Uh, meaning a color is gonna be in today and right. it might be out literally within uh, right. two or three months. Right. So it, it, the complexity behind this is, is primarily financial. So like I yeah. hit on, um, like I hit on the, uh, the, the consumers are driven by the designers. Right. But on the back end, we're looking at, um, on a very surface level, back end issues are um, GDP to debt ratio. And, and one, one of the most, uh, most uh, I think it, it, it hurts me personally that I'm, I'm seeing this happen. But um, for example, uh, Sri Lanka is in such heavy debt mm -hmm. that they're unable to repay. Mm -hmm. uh, they do not allow the transfer as funds leaving the country. They will only bring cash into the country mm -hmm. and nothing can go out. So that's one major issue. So there's really no trade that's occurring and that impacts inflation. So inflation is one factor. Uh, trade GDP to debt ratio is another factor. Supply chain is a uh, factor. This is going to eventually evolve into uh, numerous things, especially when we're looking at uh, the political situation globally. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, those things are almost all equal. I would say the primary that's driving it, the prices uh, right now, and the color is going to be designer slash um, consumer, but those other uh, factors that I just stated, I would say, are all equally important. Well, so so in other words, it is going to take at least quite a few years before the prices could level for as far as the going back to the original, the blues. I mean, yeah, blues, I, you are they are untouchable at the moment. They are, and so yeah. for you know, since the pandemic started eighteen months ago, yeah. Um, we saw a, a major uptick in, in uh, if, if you're on the wholesale side selling single stones versus production, there was a major uptick in wholesale because yep. uh, consumers needed to find a place to spend. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they're not able to travel. Uh, you know, and I would say luxury goods, whether it's wine or jewelry, you know, it kind of falls into the same categories as vacationing because it's it's uh, additional income that you don't uh, 100% uh, need to, you know, to survive. So uh, because everyone was kind of stuck at home, this was an easy outlet for for uh, them to just go shopping and find find things online. So and also on, on the online uh part um a lot of smaller stores smaller online stores who are selling through uh outlets like ig instagram you know they they were doing extremely well because they're already positioned for this position so um yeah th these are these are major directional changes that i'm seeing i would say uh just to, to hit on the answer about the direction and how long it's going to take the price usually with gemstones, once they go up, they rarely yeah. go down that is unless so there's a major war in a mm -hmm. uh, gemstone producing country. Yeah. So yeah. I can always speak back to Sri Lanka because I was flying in and out of Sri Lanka when it was a war zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, the prices were either stable or low because, um, because of that. So we might potentially see that with Afghani material uh, and I hope that you all uh, make a good decision in how you would want to per make those purchases because going back to Afghanistan, uh, it, it does play uh, a major with, with the uh, with the country being overrun by uh, by the Taliban now. I, it, it's going to play a major influence in uh, where the funding goes. That's mm -hmm. why transparency is becoming more and more important. Yeah. A couple of questions from the chat. Um, yes. are, are these stones, stones generally heated? Um, I would say right now, 30% um, unheated with green, teal, 30%, about, about 60 per, no, about 70% heated. Um, and that would be all origins. Uh, so Sri Lanka, Madagascar, um, Australia. Um, Australian sapphire has to be heated because we we use the blowpipe method, which reduces the color um, to bring out more vibrancy to the stone. So I would say nearly 100% of all Australian sapphires have to be heated. And the other question was concerning price cut blue sapphire. Uh, members have seen it selling for as much as 50k per carat with blue sapphire yes yeah I, i'll i'll move on to that that section it's something that we're we're going to be getting into here very shortly but uh 50k per carat um charles is uh, is if it's a cashmere material you know it's upwards of 200,000 per carat so uh, yeah, I, I think there was a uh, cashmere that hammered at Christie's earlier this year for I think 250 per carat. Go on to the next chapter. They're pretty nice stone. Um, but yeah, it, the blues are, the upward trajectory is so sharp and the uh, low, low, uh, low amount of supply that's uh, available to the market, it's pushing uh, consumers and designers to move towards uh, fancy colors, definitely. And you know, if, even the rate at which teal has has moved, it's gonna it's gonna be something else. It might end up being yellow, or it might end up being orange. Uh, just colors that are going to be more affordable until those uh, hit higher prices as well. Um, so moving on to blue sapphires, uh, here's some questions. So. We kind of hit on this and it's going to overlap uh, current supply and demand contrary to teal demand and supply. Um, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about Gouda. I mean, it's one of my areas of expertise. Some of you may know, some may not know. Uh, some historical pricing over 14 years, primary origin, heated versus unheated availability, trade terms versus numerical grading, uh, pricing trend, uh, time versus price heated, pricing trend, time versus price unheated. Again, ask as many questions as you like. Um, blue is a much narrower 
tolerance. So uh, everything from violetish blue, meaning blue dominant, violetish second, secondary, or blue uh, blue primary, or very slightish greenish blue. Again, as long as the uh, color description ends with blue, that is the primary color. That's what we're going to be speaking on here. So it's basically three grades within the GIA color wheel. So I'll get, um, get into the branding versus numerical grading system. Uh, this would be considered an open royal blue, uh, which is a trade term. Uh, one thing that I have noticed over my 15 years in quantifying, and um, I have a reference sample, which I also supplied to the uh, major la uh, laboratories globally, is that we want to keep numerical grading uh, in place. Uh, there, so when we look at numerical grading, you know, grading a sapphire, um, you know, on a one, two, three, four scale versus calling it uh, royal blue or uh, peacock blue or, um, or let's say, uh, you know, cashmere. The, those tend to be terms or cornflower. Those tend to be uh, a little bit arbitrary because uh, the laboratory themselves will grade them differently. You, you know, there, in my opinion, there are only three top tier labs in the world. Uh, without going into explaining which ones those are, uh, you do want to look at, you know, are the laboratories using trade terms? Are they using numerical grading system to describe the color? Or are they just, uh, you know, if they use a trade or branding term, um, it can be a little bit arbitrary because the that's 100% uh, based on the, uh, the person who's doing the evaluation. And in the end, that impacts price. Uh, I would say at this point, we want to stick to one grading method that... Um, that everyone understands, which is numbers. So uh, that, that's kind of my stance on it. And I would say the three top tier laboratories um, have, have a similar stance. And I hope you guys understand. Please ask questions on this because it does get a little bit complex. Um, next, uh, varieties of, of gyoda. Um, gyoda is the whitish material that's mined and it comes out of the ground, ground like I said, white. Uh, sometimes it, it can have a little bit more silk, uh, which is uh, titanium. And then during the heating process, um, during the heating process, essentially the silk is turning blue. It dissolves, um, which is still, you know, I hope all of you probably know that um, that is still considered a natural sapphire because we're not altering the structure of the, of the mineral. It stays the same. We're just burning off uh, excess silk and um, developing the color in just a uh, thermal enhancement. Uh, and the only other uh, the only other factor that would be considered is time. So uh, depending, so when when we're evaluating these uh, the rough, and when we're looking at uh, the amount of silk, um, then we're also determining temperature and time. And so. Uh, I don't know if you guys are all familiar with this, but um, heat, the heating method I, is actually four phase. One is low temperature, which I mentioned with the uh, metamorphic uh, sapphires that are uh, green sapphires that are mined in Australia. Low temperature, usually under about 900 degrees. Then we go to a two phase um, heating method, uh, which does short term high temperature. So between four and seven hours, starting at 15, let's say 1550 to 1950 centigrade. And then the, the variability in time is basically going to come down to the burner, the person who's running the, 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 uh, the uh, heater. And then the final uh, method is called electric heat. And nowadays, I'd say almost 70% of all sapphires blue will go through a electric heating method which is uh just longer i've had um which which kind of it's bad uh if you're the uh the owner of the rough because electric heating can take up to six sometimes nine months uh because it's just a consistent 
temperature over three months, four months, five months. And again, we evaluating the uh, we evaluating the internal inclusions, determining size, quality, and the amount of uh, available silk. And again, they're broken down into these varieties that I've spoke uh, that I've listed here at the top. So Otu's uh, primary characteristic is a small color concentration. When it's heated, that color concentration expands. And sometimes when it's cut and polished, uh, if any of you have seen uh, a concentration of color at the keelet, and then when it's, when it's uh, cut, it disperses the color. If you immerse the, the stone in water, uh, you can definitely see that uh, because water slows down the speed of light, you can definitely see that uh, the color is concentrated at one spot. Usually a skilled, skilled cutter can, uh, can focus the color in one area and have it distributed nicely. Doom is probably the easiest uh, color rough uh, or variety of Gouda to identify because it comes out of the ground blue. And then uh, because of the evenness of the silk, um, the color will typically just evenly distribute through the rough. Uh, sometimes it's preformed and or sometimes it can be just heated. Uh, the tricky ones are gonna be silk, silky and milky and diesel because the, um, like honestly on the rough end, it's like winning the lottery. And this is common in, um, in back end source countries where, uh, where, you know, you can buy a silky gouda five carats for maybe a hundred bucks and you heat it up and it's a uh, beautiful, beautiful blue. And that just went from $5 up to mm, maybe six grand. So especially when we're talking about, you know, uh, developing countries, that's a huge, huge change. And um, um, yeah, so moving on. Primary origins for sapphires right now, Burma, we all, uh, most of you might know, you know, uh, that there are uh, restrictions with Burmese imports uh, by the FTC because of the violence that's been going on there. So again, going back to how the supply chain gets uh, interrupted, um, it's, it's political, it's, uh, and it can be violent, financial, those all play into uh, where things are today, unfortunately. Uh, Burma, Sri Lanka, and Madagascar. So unfortunately, there's no good option <laughs> right now uh, because of uh, the virus situation. And the, um, like I said, the GDP to debt ratio of Sri Lanka, for example. Madagascar is an up and coming country, but does need infrastructure uh, as far as mining goes. Um, and that's a big role that I've been trying to play in that country itself is building infrastructure to uh, help the miners understand the steps or the procedures that need to be taken to, uh, to pull material out of the ground instead of strip mining. Um, so just going back to what the stone is, it's a blue sapphire, uh, I believe it is from Sri Lanka. And you can see some of the unburnt silk. That's why it has that hazy look to it. Uh, Sri Lanka also does produce some of the finest, finest uh, replicas, let's say, of, um, of Kashmir. Uh, that comes from uh, the area called Elahera. Um, and even the, even the laboratories have a hard time identifying that. Same with Madagascar. I would say going back to 2018, there, was, there were a number of, of, um, of sapphires mined in Madagascar that were being sent out to top tier labs again, which were getting um, a cashmere surf. Moving on, unheated versus heat. Uh, ninety-nine percent of all sapphire, all sa all blue sapphire is heated. Ninety-five percent of all uh, sapphire, that means pink, yellow, orange, green, ninety-five percent are heated. Uh, if you like, I said, if we go back to the comment I said earlier, where we're looking at you know sixty, seventy percent uh, heated, that's only specific to green. But if we look at the entire sapphire market. 95% heated, 5% unheated. 1% uh, unheated in blue, 99% heated in, 1% um, unheated in blue, 99% is gonna be heated.
this was uh, the kind of tone color of the year. Um, so supply and demand was, uh, supply was unfortunately low uh, for considering Panatone kind of sets the standard. Um, but unfortunately, you know, through, through a difficult year last year, so many things shut down. A lot of the material that was hitting the market was already available. And I think the, uh, the secondary market was doing pretty well for a little while. Um, I've had a number of dealers come into the office um, or actually estate dealers, uh, you know, asking me to evaluate and see if I'm interested in buying because uh, of the low output from source countries. Um, just threw this in there. This is a typical, if we were going to use a trade term, cornflower, cornflower blue. And we, we can look at some pricing here. Um, going back to 2018, we are looking at time versus price for heated and unheated. And we're looking at a size of two to three carat average, royal blue to open blue. So unheated is the darker, uh, darker graph here. And going back to 2008, 850 per carat. And 2019, we're looking at uh, 4550, 4,500 per carat. I would say at 2021 July, we're probably looking at upwards of 6,500 per carat. So substantial jump. Uh, jump. Uh, I would say between 19 to 21, at least 30% um, in these sizes. Uh, when we're looking at heated, um, we're looking at about 450 back in 2018 and jumping all the way up to 2,200. Um, again, two to three carat sizes. I, I would say we are looking at today, 2021, uh, closer to 4,000, uh, well, closer to 3,000 per carat for nice, fine, uh, fine quality blue that's heated. My predictions, blue sapphire is the most popular colored stone in the United States. A steady trajectory in price will continue for the, next, uh, for the foreseeable future. Silver and rust natural disasters are the only reasons I believe uh, will cause volatility. Sri Lanka uh, being one of the largest producers of blue sapphire has only mined 3% of its land. That's a good stat to keep in mind. Unheated blue sapphire in three to seven, uh, three to seven carat sizes. We'll see pricing increase of 20 to 25%. That should be probably more around 35 to 40% over uh, year over year, specifically Burmese and Sri Lanka. Keep that, price, keep that number in mind. It's gonna be important moving forward as we see more volatility uh, with uh, blue sapphire production and then shifting colors. Okay, and I'm ready to take more questions on blue. Um, when, when you say, um, when you give the, the numerical grading, does that, uh, what, what is that based on the one, two, three, four? Is that, is that the GIA grading? Cause that's yeah. different. Yeah. So GIA, uh, the GIA standard, uh, I would say sh uh, is and should be uh, the industry standard for laboratories. Unfortunately, some laboratories look at it as a opportunity to um, twist trade terms to benefit. So some laboratories are gonna do millions and millions and millions of certs per year. Mm -hmm. That's their goal as a business to pop out certs. Certain markets without me actually stating uh, are so brand heavy, it's cultural. So if they can get a, a pigeon blood red on a, uh, on a certificate, it carries substantial weight for them. Um, but the accuracy of the certificate is the issue. So, uh, I actually went to the extent of grading the laboratories. So I have top tier, first tier labs, like I said, three. There are probably another three second tier and so on and forth and so forth. I, I, I would say down to a fourth tier lab. Um, 
and anything beyond fourth year is really worth even mentioning. So like my, how my business model in particular works is we have overlapping ethical, sustainable uh, transparency, and then you have wholesale. So a dealer who's wholesaling might uh, be one of 15 people who touch, touch the stone and adds it on you know, 20% versus on a fully transparent uh, chain of custody, um, it's coming straight from the mine to the uh, designer or the retailer's hand, but the cost to operate that way is absurdly high uh, because we're constantly verifying, uh, we're verifying that the uh, that the product is what it is supposed to be, even when it changes hands between mining, uh, cutting, heat treatment, uh, laboratories, multiple laboratories, and then distribution. When you say follow GIA and you're talking about numerical, that means like O R R O five five, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not not all laboratories follow the same protocol, and that's right. probably uh, that's probably one of the biggest issues. So uh, some laboratories will follow their own protocol, which is put in place uh, to make the business more profitable. Uh, I'm not trying to be here or um, they, you know, try to tell a, a, a business owner how they need to run their business. But I definitely am for on the ethical side, standardization, and especially on the top, top tier laboratory. And uh, that once that uh, numerical grading is standardized across the board because all graders, all laboratories understand the numbers. When we, uh, when we move into a trade term context, uh, example, Peacock, Royal, Cornflower, everyone's uh, minute differences can make each person's eye view it differently. And that's what we're trying to eliminate. So then it turns into an issue of how many certificates do you want? Would you like one or two? Or do you want to have to recertify every five years or every three years? I know a number of stones right now uh, that need recertification just because the certification process is outdated 20, 25 years, which is understandable. But if you're trying to, uh, like if you're trying to broker a stone and it's been certified in at one laboratory, which I would say is second tier, uh, but it has the right branding as far as the color type, um, it, it's just not going to last. It, it, the, the cert will carry its weight for a year, maybe two years, but it would require recertification, I believe. Uh, Sri Lanka has the history behind it being a source country, uh, similar to Thailand. Uh, Thailand is a major distributing point. Uh, Colombo is turning into probably a, sec a second distributing point at this point, at, at this time. But um, Sri Lankans, actually right now, I would say the Thais, the Sri Lankans, the Chinese, they just go and sit at the mine site. Uh, hoping to get first dibs and then um, make offers. Um, and that, that's where it's, if you're a source buyer, you need to know what you're buying. You need to know it. And that includes knowing the origin because uh, if you're a source buyer, Sri Lankans or whoever, I'm not going to put it just on them, but they will try to pass it off as Sri Lankan material uh, until you're able to uh, prove differently. And so Ethiopian material, uh, it has specific inclusions and uh, definitely a lighter tone and um, lighter hue. Uh, like the hue is identifiable, but definitely the tone is lighter, which obviously um, is going to impact the price. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. The, it's the saturation that is uh, a little bit weaker, not the hue. The hue is blue, but uh, the saturation is weaker. For example, with their, with their greens and their blues tend to be more uh, pastel. So uh, moving on to peach, uh, it's blended mix of pink, a pinkish orange to orangish pink. I, for me in the field, um, I, I do like a quick evaluation and uh, I need to see 80% of one color and minimum of 20% of the other. Um, so if it falls below those tolerances, 80-20, it's going to fall into a peach. If it falls above that, it's going to be a bud barrage. Um, again, we're going to hit on what's driving the market, similar to teal, very similar. Um, 
sample of peach uh, and their color range. Real question, uh, the, the harder alternative to morganite or alternative paparaja. So we're looking at hardness or uh, lack of, lack of uh, tone and saturation like, uh, like the paparaja. Uh, this color does uh, pose a stability, color stability issue. We'll go over that really quickly. And um, I'm happy to say the pricing is actually very, very stable. Um, it does rival peach as far as a popular color, but it's much more stable than peach at this point. So uh, going back to uh, the color, color wheel, we're looking at, again, for peach, it's gonna be a lighter tone, lighter tone and uh, weaker saturation. So looking at anything in this reddish orange all the way over to orangish yellow. So basically about a six color range. Uh, tone scale usually with peaches is gonna be medium light to very light. Saturation scale is gonna be somewhere in the uh, two to three range. And so here we're looking at this, this one is, this is a peach, but um, frequently considered or called a champagne color. Again, I'm referring back to the 80, 20% of one color and 80% of the other. I'm referencing to uh, the uh, orange and pink specifically. So if there is, in my book, when I'm in the field, I'm looking to get as close to 50-50. Closer we are to 50-50, the higher the chance of Babaraja. The difference, uh, you're looking at um, basically, you know, a $400 stone or a $2,000 stone. That takes, uh, it just takes practice. So um, it has, a, uh, again, similar market to teal green, uh, teal and green sapphire, alternative bridal. And again, it's more uh, demand driven of a demand driven color and um, designer driven. Example of a peach sapphire with lower tone and saturation. Stability issues in peach. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but this, this overlaps with the yellow as well. So when we go back to the color wheel, uh, I think, let me just go back. So the, the stability issue in this color, peach, will, will, uh, will also be an issue with Padparaja and yellow. So everything from, I would say yellow right here to orangish, uh, reddish orange, orangish red. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar, but at specific temperature points in, um, in light, and that could be, um, it's usually happening in daylight, the color loss. Uh, yeah, there, there will be a loss of color and it can go completely white. Uh, the reason for this is still a phenomenon, but there have been new tests that have been developed specifically called the fade test. And the fade test will basically test the stone's limitations of uh, with temperature and light. Uh, in my in my um, my experience, we we actually had a we were at the Hong Kong show um, a number of years ago. We had I think it was about a seven carat yellow sapphire, and we just stuck it in the case in the morning, and by evening it had turned white. So uh, that was like our lesson, and then we. We went back and uh, talked to our guru in Sri Lanka about it. If it's caught within a reasonable amount of time, there it is reversible, but we it, the uh, color uh, will consistently be unstable. So uh, the one again, uh, it can be reversed with UV light and uh, temperature, and usually the temperature for reversal ends up being. Um, ends up being roughly 80 degrees and under a UV light. 
Um, so, I mean, here's a funny story. I actually sold one of these. Uh, unfortunately, I was, I was um, this was probably right around 2014, customer bought a yellow sapphire and um, about two weeks later, they called me up and they just said, look, the, we were setting it. And she told me that it was the, it was the, um, she felt like the color changed under the temperature um, of her torch while she was setting it or mounting it. And I called her, I, I asked her, so what happened? And she just said, look, maybe the torch got a little too close. The temperature just basically turned white and um, the customer is picking it up tomorrow. So I spoke to, I, I was trained by Mr. Donapala in, in Ratnapura, who is basically, I would say, one of the top three in the world in, in uh, thermal enhancement. And I asked him what to do. And his answer was, tell her to put it in her mouth. And I was like, huh. And then after, she said one, he told me one hour in her mouth and then overnight in uh, under UV light and the color came back. So it was caught in time, the adjustments were made and uh, it was still a product that was sold. She had to disclose that it was fading. But um, the point is the mouth is because of temperature. And so when we think of rural Sri Lanka, yeah, that's the first thing they're gonna say, stick it in your mouth, it's 98 degrees. And then stick it in UV light to bring back the color. So uh, this is the first occurrence for me is 2004. But that is gonna be a permanent issue. Uh, I see more uh, instability in color coming from Madagascar, uh, but uh, you know, from a laboratory le uh, level and from a chemistry level, uh, laboratories don't care what the origin is as far because if it's happening in Madagascar, it really could uh, happen in Sri Lanka as well or other countries. So that being said, uh, that's kind of the state of um, state of the peach color and Padparaja and yellow with uh, testing stability. Are there problems origin related? Like I mentioned, uh, I'm seeing this. I am personally seeing this primarily coming out of Madagascar but they are doing the uh, same test. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, because of the theory of Pangaea where all the continents were connected millions and possibly billions of years ago, um, geologically, it has to be similar in, in all the countries within that region at least. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is definitely origin related as well. And so we're just looking at a couple more peaches here. Uh, well, in the peach category. Uh, I just to give you an idea of ketone saturation here, we're, we're looking at a um, pinkish yellow, or no, sorry, a yellowish pink, and probably a tone of about two and saturation of two to three. This is uh, also a peach more in the um, champagne color, but an orange dominant yellow second. Again, uh, close to the champagne color, orange dominant, yellow secondary. And if we look at the uh, trajectory for this right now, uh, starting in 2015, uh, you're looking at you know $25 a carat. And the, I would say current 2019, was about a hundred, and we'll just say it was about 200 peach right now in this size range is running about 500 a carat. So substantially, substantial change in price, but um, I'm sorry, I was, I was reading your volume so that we were doing, there was a substantial change in volume from 38 carats in 2017 to a, a 268 carats in 2018 and 19, uh, about 193. Um, I'm gonna say at this point, our volume is probably back at 2018 numbers, just because it's not moving very quickly each. Uh, uh, Price-wise, 2015 at uh, 350 per carat, and 2019, 570. I would say right now, 2021 uh, for two to four carat sizes, you're looking at about 800 per carat, uh, eight to 850. 
uh, and because of the fading issue, um, you know, we do have to, and primarily most of the top labs are able to do that test. Uh, you do have to add on, you know, the additional 154 A certificate minimum in in that in that size range. So my predictions, even though there are stability issues with the lab cert, the issue can be eliminated with a fade test. This color has lower long long term price volatility versus uh, versus teal green. Use of numeric numerical grading will be helpful since peach has a lower tone. This story, what you told me, that is that scares me. That sounds like having a heated kunzite in a window, in, mm -hmm. in a heat in in a sun, and suddenly it's white. Yes, that's I exactly never, that's exactly what's happening right now. It is. It is the most uh, scary thing I heard. I mean, I didn't. I I knew lots of uh, treatments are going on, yeah. uh, like a surface treatment, like a HBHP, uh, HBRT, like. Um, uh, what's that uh, almost 10 years or 15 years ago when Thailand uh, uh, really Brilliant. flooded the market yeah. with uh, just drop that gorgeous pod taking such a, a low quality um, uh, stones from Sri Lanka and just, uh, you know, using it to all kind of, you know, chemicals and the, yeah. uh, really modifying the atoms of the stone. That was scary. And I'm glad it took uh, all the global our uh, reputable labs long time to go after and then they uh, you know eventually released it so yeah. this this is totally a uh, scary very scary yeah thing. yeah um, and actually because the laboratories are testing tolerance of the stone yeah. yeah the reason that it becomes scary is because the temperature testing the stone in the laboratory uh, setting and the temperature, if it's uh, if the tall the threshold of the temperature is too high, mm -hmm. uh, natural sapphires that are unheated with let's say a fracture internally internal mm -hmm. fracture, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. can cause the stone to uh, to break in half. Rupture, right? Yeah. Rupture. So that is true. Uh, nowadays, uh, the labs that are doing this testing method, they actually will ask for a display a um, approval to do it because of, and they will typically they'll call you and let you know. Uh, but they won't take um, the responsibility if they if you approve the test and it and it cracks. So it, those are all new factors that we have to consider. Um, yeah. So, but it, it is an important factor because we don't want to pass off uh, a stone to a customer potentially that uh, where the stone would fade. You know, it's. Yeah, I mean, it just, yeah, it, it is just, just ethically wrong. Right, and, exactly. and as long as we disclose it, I mean, it shouldn't happen. Either exactly. we should not focus on any artificial treatment, or if we are going to do it, do it correct and stability of the color and, mm -hmm. you know, and bringing the beauty. And we all know it. What is the purpose of heating it? It is just to bring the beauty of the taking inexpensive stones and just making them looking pretty without yeah. modifying their atoms and without any, you know, artificial uh, chemicals have been used and modify the identity of the stone. We all know that. Yeah. But if we are going to go in that, uh, this is just, <laughs> it's very uncomfortable, very, very, you yeah. Know, yeah, I, I can imagine. I think especially for freestanding stores where yep. they have to make a determination or if you're in the state and you're taking in a piece, you, yep. yeah, I mean, I highly recommend uh, going the laboratory route. I the, <laughs> I try not to overlap, overlap with the laboratories as far as the work that I do, but yep. I, I, I am um, quite happy that I, I do uh, help provide them with sam reference samples. Right. So right. That they can help improve the testing, the testing process. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, the sooner, you know, it might take a few years, but eventually they'll identify what's causing that. And, yeah. And uh, hopefully notify, notify everyone. Yeah. There was a, a large influx in ber beryllium treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's every chance yeah. that they were beryllium treated stones. Uh, disclosure, you know, especially in source countries, you have to know what the treatment is and then uh, kind of understand how beryllium, uh, beryllium works and how it impacts the, the stone and then uh, ask them, you know, what sort of treatment. 
sometimes the problem is when you're buying in source countries, the sales uh, people don't know. They just, yeah. it's, it's not like they're trying to deceive you, but they just don't know. But um, yeah, from your description and then putting that together with the time frame, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical that it might have been a, a issue of brewery. And so the beryllium, the beryllium has various isotopes. So it's not uh, they use it why as a radioactive or how do they use the beryllium? Uh, beryllium basically they use it. Uh, you know, it, it it is a chemical, and so they basically heat it in a furnace. And so then we look at different heating methods, and then how uh, the depth of the uh, the depth of the absorption of beryllium. So most of the brilliant that was being done uh, back in the um, but in that time frame, let's say early 2000s, it even goes back a little bit before that. Uh, it's just surface beryllium, surface mm -hmm. diffusion. So um, I don't know. I would say if you cut it open, it's going to be have maybe having a white center. Oh, oh wow! So and, and that that goes for the whole necklace, the whole all the colors, basically. Possibly, possibly. I mean. It, the goal of let's say you're looking at a necklace the goal is to get all the colors to match nicely yeah so yeah. The, it could That's, be a mixture of nat fully natural and then a mixture of beryllium but yeah. i'm again i'm making that assumption based on uh, popularity at a specific time frame yeah. and the fact that you are doing this in a source uh, like looking at them in a source country so yeah. um uh, I, I believe that the temperature, the beryllium, actually, they actually modify the atom. They, they heat it in the furnace in such a high temperature, as high as, if I remember correctly, 1600 to 2000 degrees, something like that, where actually the stone melts and then it's really, really, you know, uh, melts and then re solidify, but it's all, all in the surface. I mean, it just uh, take a very, very poor quality stone and make them looking drop dead gorgeous. And this is how the pot was flooded at that time in, you know, the Asia, in uh, Hong Kong and all that. And yeah. suddenly it was as a, wow, how come the pots are, first of all, the rarity, and then the market was flooded. But anyway, yeah, this is... Uh... Uh, so the last area uh, section that I'll speak on is uh, Pot Baraja. Uh, color description, again, Trade term, rising sun, setting sun, lotus flower. How does origin impact price? Um, you know, um, and then again, we're using that 2080 description uh, and site identification, especially in source countries. New sources of uh, Pat Baraja, again, going back to this color stability. I think we, uh, we hammered down on that one before it gets more complex, which I would say would require a few more hours. Uh, traditionalists believe Padraja can only be from Sri Lanka, and they're willing to pay a premium for that. So moving on, uh, description: rising and setting sun, lotus flower. So this is uh, this is what would be considered a setting sun, kind of pinkish. Uh, and also, these fall into uh, two separate markets. So the orangish, orangish dominant, pinkish secondary is uh, popular in the United States and Western countries. Um, the pinkish dominant orange secondary is more popular in the East, meaning Asia. Uh, origin impact, uh, definitely, definitely. The traditionalists only ask for Sri Lanka uh, or for the Sri Lankan uh, Padparaja. Uh, as some of you know, uh, the trade term for it is the King Sapphire. It is absolutely beautiful. And uh, I, I, I should have thought about it, but I didn't put that slide in. But if you hold a uh, lotus flower next to a, uh, a fine, fine Padparaja, it'll look exactly the same. Uh, and it's essentially that separation of color, uh, but also a nice blend. Uh, so you can see the distinctive, let's say, zoning between orange and uh, orange and pink, which makes it uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, again, we're looking at for a patraja, I would say the hue uh, in that orangish pink to pinkish orange uh, range and a tone of saturation of over four um, for each, four or five. Um, if I would typically, if it falls under that, 
and there's no strong color zoning that shows pink and orange, it's not going to get a pod project server. Um, going over this guy, just from looking at this one, it's 100% or Madagascar based on the inclusions. Uh, so if you can see the little uh, crystal bubbles, uh, if there are, I would say, an explicit number of them, and I'm sure under 10x, uh, 10x magnification, we can see uh, substantially more than we see in this picture. Um, you, you'd be able to identify it definitely as Madagascar. Again, pink dominant and um, and orangish secondary. And that will end my presentation. That uh, note, thank you so much. It was wonderful. 